Hello and welcome to the Block Talk podcast with me, Brian Welsh, and Jax Bruce. This is the second of a two-part episode with Christian Bruce, partner at Red Path Bruce. In this episode, Christian talks about the Better Lives program, his most interesting project to date, and he answers our three quirky questions. Um, look out for them, so there's some really good stuff in there. We hope you enjoy the episode. The Block Talk podcast started because of my passion for the property management industry. I wanted to start a conversation and add some value within the industry with a diverse range of people and professionals who can add something extra. As we start out, my aim is that the podcast offers some useful insight into a variety of views, opinions, thoughts, and foresights from our guests who include business leaders and industry experts. If you enjoy the podcast and want to find out any other information, head on over to brianwelsh.co.uk. So <clears throat> Red Path Bruce are involved in the Better Lives program. Could you tell us tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so this is um uh, we we have we we struggled with this because we've we've supported local charities and local um organizations for years. And um, you know, even before websites and and all the rest of it, and you just quietly get on with that. You know, it's very sort of old school west of Scotland that you you, you know you don't blow your own trumpet. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, we've never really done any formal marketing or um, uh, until until suppose you had to do hard sales. Then people are like, well, what, what, what's your story? And you're kind of like, oh, gosh, well, what is our story? And then when you start to write it down, you realize, oh, we, we do quite a lot of good stuff. Um, but, you know, we, we kind of do it quietly in the background. And so um, that era has passed now. You know, people expect you to to blow your own trumpet they want to yeah. know what tune that trumpet plays um, and for two reasons is this a business i want to align myself with and and secondly is this a business i'd like to work for so it, it you know we, we were kind of kicking and screaming came to the table the social media table we now have a marketing consultant like yourself that does our social media and um I, ron and i still have to kind of vet everything because of course it's going out in our name we need to know actually what it's going to say but she's she's fantastic a girl claire um, miller at go compass and um uh she's uh she's really taken us leaps and bounds into this um the ugly world of social media which it, it, it's a kind of poison chalice isn't it you can promote yourself on there but you're also open to um the trolls and the and the and the, the negativity that of which there's so much out there so we yeah. were we were very well to put to find a, a point on or terrified of it um but i suppose it has given us the ability to actually as humbly as we can talk about the stuff that we do and a better lives program is the, the sort of strap line we've given to our philanthropy and our giving um and there's a list there of our sort of local um uh organizations you'll use many of which you'll recognize that we, we regularly give to um very often it's youth sport that we like to we're, we're big believers in sport with very strong sporting heritage you know my my uncle who was a former partner at red path bruce played rugby for scotland um i've got a niece that's rode for great britain and you know i've played plenty of rugby and and um we know the benefits of team sport and um sport among the youth we've just recently um uh, join uh, the Observatory for Sport in Scotland, which is to lobby the government to get more sports uh, to to children in all walks of life. And um, uh, you know, we just feel very strongly about health and well-being, and 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 exercise for to to really dumb it down to its simplest form. Um, so that's one we've recently supported. But the, so ultimately, on that page of our website, you'll see um, those more sort of scottish based and local um uh operations that we support and i know a lot of our competitors do much the same thing and i think it is a, it's a very healthy way to to run your business and um but the better lives program is, is far wider than that it's, it's global um in terms of buy one give one which is the b1 g1 side of that and i direct anyone to our website just have a look at it i, I won't ever explain it well enough but uh in in conjunction with um Russell and Russell are an accountants in the West End with um, uh, Begley Brown, who are IFAs, are 
um, friends of mine had me along to a, a co couple of coaching sessions with a guy called Paul Dunn, who's an Australian um, business coach. And um, I mean, he's an incredible guy. I mean, these guys are, and there's lots of them out there. They're just bouncing off the walls um, mm -hmm. with with ideas and and in, and energy and enthusiasm, all the things that I love to see in people. And um, he got in tour with a lady, uh, Masami Sato, uh, who's, um, I think, from Southeast Asia, if I'm correct. I, I don't want to say anything and get it wrong, but ultimately they collaborated in, to make um, buy one, give one, which is, is effectively when you do business, a certain element of whatever fee you charge, you, um, uh, you, you, you spend on an impact, and that impact could be anywhere in the world. It could be the, 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 way, the lovely way they've set it up or they describe it to you is you've got a, a client, this Brian Welsh, you're my client. I've done a bit of work for you. Um, I bill you, let's say, 5,000 pounds for something. Uh, obviously, that's very cheap, but um, I've done you a deal. And um, But unbeknownst to you, I know you're into music, so I then go into the, the various um, opportunities and then buy one, give one, and I see that there's um, uh, music lessons for children and um, Bulawayo and Zimbabwe or somewhere like that. And uh, you buy compact disc players and headphones and a set of lessons or something. And um, you can do 50 of those for 150, 200 pounds or something. So I, 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 I do 50 impacts like that. I then get a certificate that says you've done these impacts for these children in Bulawayo. And, and I send it to Brian Welsh and I say, Brian, as a result of doing business with Red Path Bruce, you've actually inadvertently given music lessons to these 50 kids in, in Zimbabwe. And you go, wow. And we've helped the kids. We've made you feel good. And we've spent an element, a percentage of that fee on a good cause. And, um, and that's really the nature of, of buy one, give one. That's where the term buy one, give one comes from. Um, it's slightly different. What we do, we tend to do it in chunks. And uh, so we, we, because we've got 13,000 clients, you yeah, can, sure. can't write to them all doing that. We don't. So what we do is we just take lumps of our fees from time to time during the year and round and we'll, we'll select some impacts and, um, and, and we'll, we'll send some money uh, into the buy one, give one machine. And, um, and it's brilliant. And you can see them ticking over on their website and you can see how many thousand impacts you've done and where you've put water in and, um, you know, it's it, there's there's three things going on here. There's the actual ph philanthropy, which we want all our staff and everyone to feel good about the fact they're involved in that, and that our hard work is 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 for the betterment. You know, of these sustainable goals, which um, are wonderful, and I think we all need to embrace a bit more. And and in a in a society where ESG is just becoming part of mainstream vocabulary. You know, we could potentially be seen as early adopters of that, but we certainly weren't first. Um, but we we loved the idea so much, and you know, Masami and Paul were so inspiring. We we're like, we can do this, and yeah, it's it. There's a cost to it, but the benefits far outweigh it. And um, and so what happens then is, you know, people look at your business. Maybe they go, I actually think that that whole message should be front and center of the website. You know, your why that everyone talks yeah. about, yeah. Um, you know, why do we work? Well, our why goes with something along the lines of to, to uh, maintain and improve the, the built environment around our clients and thereby um, that environment that anyone might come in contact with. So we're not just benefiting our clients who pay us money to cut the grass and to, to, to fix things. You know, anyone that goes through the realm of that property will also benefit from that. <clears throat> but beyond that, by billing you for the works we've done, we're also doing this over here. And anyone says, wow, well, okay, never much like factors, but well, this one seems to be trying to do better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not the finished article and we will we'll struggle to ever be that. No one ever is, but, um, so if the customer then goes, okay, I like how they do that. I like the way they're doing that. You've then got the, the other side of the coin is that you then might become employer of choice because um, people go, oh, I, I like the philosophy, the culture of that business. I, I want to go and see maybe would they want to employ me because I want to be part of that. Um, and, you know, then if you attract the best people, then, you know, the, the, the reward for you as a business owner, which isn't actually the goal. The goal is to give. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. reward could be that you're attracting better people and the better your people, 
the better your business. And and so I can't see a downside to any of this. Um, and where we might have, and the only change I think is where you might have quietly just gone on, got on with that in the background, you now make it public. Um, not to say, look at us, aren't we wonderful? But actually just to create that cycle. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, and I think nowadays it, there's an expectation that businesses are being responsible, um, being sustainable. We're, we're uh, I don't know, we've got six, seven, I think maybe eight uh, pure electric cars now. Uh, I, if you'd asked me two years ago, if we well, probably two or three years ago, didn't have any electric cars. I was, I'm into my cars and I was a naysayer. Yeah. But um, there's obviously huge benefits to the employee in terms of P11D and, and, and tax breaks, et cetera. But actually, you know, it excites me that we can make small differences by by reducing our emissions and actually reduces our fuel bill as a business. And, and from, from a money point of view, that, that excites me as well. Um, so, yeah, you if, know, you could do, if you do something that's right, that also saves cash, you know, then then it's a it's a no brainer, isn't it? It's so. absolutely. And so that was that's really in a nutshell what what the Better Lives program is about us. But Ryan and I often talk about how whilst it's up there on our website, um, you know, we don't maybe um, we're still a bit bashful about it. And yeah. and in a funny sort of way, you know, in the tough days when you're just complaints handling and and trying to put out fires. It's easy to forget why on earth we do this job at all because yeah. um, it, the, sometimes it's incredibly thankless. So this is the sort of thing you keep to remind yourself. Actually, no, we're, we're predominantly we're doing things well. We're doing the right stuff, and and it's all driven by the right um, purpose. And and um, even doing this podcast just now kind of reminds me. Oh yeah, that's that's why we go to work. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 really interesting. I must I must look into that a bit more. I did look at it on your website before we started, but I must look into that a bit more. That it's really easy program. to do. Yeah. I, I think businesses, anyone listening to this, just go and join it. It's not exclusive yeah. to Red Path Bruce. I mean, it's uh, if every factor suddenly had B one G one on their um, on their website and they started giving some money, even small impacts to all over the world, I would be so chuffed. Um, yeah. uh, and you know, spread the word. CPL yeah. next on the list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yes. Yeah. 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 We're going to look at it. You'll so have to sell the house in the Isle of Wight, though, of course. Yes, I know. I know. I might cut that bit, but never mind. <laughs> yeah, you can edit that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but that does sound really, really interesting. Really, really interesting. And, it, and it's uh, the whole point of it giving back um, and actually saying to the person, and you, you're right, you know, for. For CPL, we have forty clients. You know what I mean. So that that's an easy, far easier thing for us to do yeah. than it is for for you with thirteen thousand or someone with you know multiple thousands. Of, of, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 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 bringing so just talking about kind of work and why you do this and all this sort of stuff. Is there a project that's interest you most across your career, and what is it? Uh, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this one because there's there's lots of things you can imagine. I'm yeah. I don't want to admit how long I've been working, you know, but over thirty years or so, um, it was a million stories. But actually, the one that I think crops up in my head, and so I'm going to dive in with it, is directly across the road from our Glasgow office. I think is the ugliest, um, biggest eyesore in Glasgow and that's 141 West Regent Street which is rotting away slowly um, yeah. halfway up the street just one block down from Leicester Square and um, I've uh, I mean if you you'll know the building everyone in yes. Glasgow knows the building and you go past it and going surely something can be done with that and uh, it was owned by someone who actually became a client of ours we managed it briefly until it was unmanageable um, but I then I, I then contrived to broker the sale of it to uh, a developer client of mine so and successfully did there were just myself I, I brought buyer and seller together and um, they shared my fees 50 50 uh, I, I would have done it for nothing if I was perfectly honest with you just to see this thing move forward and um, to his credit the developer got the, the, the great issue with it was Greek Thompson had once set foot in the building and so it was listed 
um, and you've got massive issues with 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 listed buildings and demolition. But he managed to get the listed build, building consent to demolish it, and a a, a planning permission for a seven story service department block with a restaurant at ground floor. And it looks really funky. If you go on the porthole, you'll be able to see it's got copper paneling and, and it butts in different places at, at, at various levels up the building. It's quite an attractive, um, it's modern yep. and, and it would it will dwarf um, everything uh, south of it until you get to uh, 101 West Regent Street, which is the big building next to our old offices. Um, yep. But, uh, my view is if 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 so that subsequently that 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 company went into administration and John Greer of Car Cargo Consultants is a really good mate of mine. We'd been chatting about it for a while, and he brought a client along and managed to to purchase it out of administration. And they have they're just about to start knocking it down. And fingers crossed. So we're seeing some progress there, and we'll have to live in a building site for for two years, and our windows will be filthy, and uh, we'll be walking rubbish into the the building for which happened when they built one uh, uh, what's the one one of one one West Regent Street. But it's a it's a price worth paying for that that site to be redeveloped, and um, you know I don't I'll have played a little part in in the progress of that site. But you know, it has depressed office rents in in the whole of West Student Street. I'd say, save for maybe down the bottom end at, at number one, where there's fancy Grade A buildings. But um, and and also, it's, it's it's made the street less attractive to people. Not yes. least, Ryan in my office actually stares out at it, and I've been looking wow. at it for five years. So, yeah, so, did, so did your boardroom, <laughs> I recall as well. Yeah, yeah, no, the boardroom does too. So. Um, you know, if that building gets dropped this year and, and this um, sexy seven story service department block goes up, um, my work on this planet will be done. Right, okay. <laughs> okay. So that is actually quite impressive. I remember looking out because uh, I was in your office uh, sometime within the last six weeks, and, and um, I remember looking out, and there's actually um, uh, some uh, sort of drape down the front of it is pictures of what it's going to look like as well. Mm. So I recall seeing that, and it does look like a, a magnificent modern, but but a, but a good looking building. Yeah, fingers crossed that that there isn't anything gets in the way of it. But I think the ball's rolling; it's going to happen, and I'm really excited about it. Um, so that's a project I think that 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 I'll look back and go, well, we made a difference there to that little corner of Glasgow, which you know we're very close to. I mean, grandfather. William Redpath Bruce, he he set up office in in um, one hundred three West Street Street, which was effectively the equivalent of a serviced offices back then in a single room. Right. Okay. Um, they then moved to Bath Street and various other locations. I think in between as the business grew, <clears throat> then Russell and my father Ian bought one hundred three West Street Street. I think not not through any romantic notion. I think it just became available. They probably didn't even recall at the time that that um, their father had, had started there. And I think we were 38 years in that um, location. And then Ryan mm -hmm. and I bought 152 West Regent Street. But West Regent Street's been very much the, the Red Path Bruce Street. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so to make a little difference to the, that, that, that sort of crumbling building would, would yeah, it would be a charming little little anecdote, I think. Um, yeah, that would be brilliant. That would be brilliant. And let's hope, that, let's hope they start it in the, in the, shortly, yeah. yeah. Good, good. That's excellent. Um, so coming back to the kind of property management thing um, and the challenges in, in the market and, and, and such like, um, when you think about the, the future of property management, what do you see? Um, utter carnage, Brian. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. In, in, in a utopian world, I'd see factors and property managers universally seen as allies to their owners and their customers and, and not as a necessary evil. And we really do need to change the, um, uh, the rhetoric around property management. And uh, it's, it's a bit of an oil tanker trying to turn it around. Um, and, and it's all about education and communication and our clients knowing what we do, but more importantly, knowing what we don't do, what they shouldn't expect us to do. And if they do want us to do it, um, how is that? How is that remunerated? Um, mm -hmm. And do we want to actually do that? Um, so um, I think we need to work as a as a group, and this comes back to us 
I think before we were online, as it were, talking about the PMAS and the role that that um, organization has to um, bring together all factors and 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 be able to, you know, there's going to be, um, well, two, two, two big changes. I mean, digitization is already the great disruptor in most industries, and it will be no different in ours. Um, and you'll constantly be striving to make CPL more, um, you know, flexible, faster, quicker, more usable. I mean, you'll be constantly improving it and um, and and developing it uh, alongside us. You know, you you use your your customers as your um, um, you know your front end designers, uh, which yeah, is great. For, for and direction, have, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and the collaboration between CPL and 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 the factoring industries is is fantastic. I think. Um, and more of that. Uh, but I still, I constantly rack my brain to say, what app is going to replace the factor, you know, and who's going to design it and can I, can I um, patent it? <laughs> but um, I just can't see, I can't imagine the scenario where an algorithm can decipher what is common and what is private, um, you know, to know every deed of condition, to know if that balcony is actually a private balcony or it's a common fabric of the building and everyone contributes to it. Now, it's almost certainly possible, but in the end of the day, you know, can that algorithm, you know, negotiate between parties and disagreement? I just, I, I can't imagine it. I can't imagine a scenario where just a couple of clicks and things will get sorted. The plumber will show up and we'll know who to bill and who not to bill. bill. So there will always be the requirement for human intervention in property management. Um, no question. Now, we can be more efficient with our systems, process procedures, collection of money, um, uh, you know, chasing of debt. Uh, and we're working at that all the time. I mean, every week we're, we're looking at new processes. We're looking at, at, at new um, work streams that, that could be better, you know, to, because, you know, we, we can't incrementally increase our charges. So we have to find efficient, more efficient ways of, of, of working um, that allows us to be profitable. Uh, and, and to deliver a, a quality of service that we're happy with. Uh, moreover, our clients are happy with. Um, so that, that, that's the first thing, you know, where, where the digital revolution, it's got to play a part and we've got to embrace it. And, and, and as an industry, um, uh, be, be far sharper, and, you know, throw off the sort of shackles of the dusty house factor and old, you know, paper files that, that we're, we're probably famous for. Um, or infamous for, uh, which we've most most businesses have done. They've come miles, but I, I still don't know if we're necessarily getting the credit for that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the the other thing is the actual deterioration of housing stock um, and the challenges that's going to have alongside the requirement for greener, more sustainable buildings and the need to improve energy efficiency in, in older buildings. These are huge asks. I'm going to put aside. The, the Grenfell panel uh, issue and and well, there's just one thing you know that's that's front and center at the moment but you know we there's going to be demands by probably European global demands that buildings must be X Y and Z and we were seeing it with EPCs already um, there's a lot of properties that aren't managed you know thousands of properties in multiple ownership in in the, in the UK but certainly in Scotland. Uh, and, and probably predominantly in Edinburgh, where they only embraced factoring, um, you know, in the latter half of the, the last century. Um, you know, that it may become policy that, that these buildings, uh, it's compulsory for them to have a, a common manager. Yeah. Uh, now, you can look at that two ways. You know, it's an excellent growth opportunity for the factoring industry, you know, um, but put a hell of a lot of pressure on, on, on the industry. I mean, everyone's busy already. I mean, we're all ambitious. We want to grow, but quite how quickly and by how much, I think it, you, you've got to be careful. You don't um, overstretch yourself. And well, we all know the, the downside of that, uh, you know, over promise, under deliver. Um, you can't sustain service levels and, and the whole thing goes pear shaped very quickly. So, you know, I'm very conscious of that as we look at our growth um, over the next, um, you know, three to five years, uh, you've got to be careful exactly. Um, the, the, the pace and, and, and size of that. Uh, but if it becomes policy, and it may well do because you've got to force people to take responsibility to look after their buildings. And, and it's a cost to them that they don't currently suffer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think we'll see changes in, in government policy with regards to buildings and multiple ownership. And the factoring industry will will be uh, in the firing line. They, they will be the first port of call. And are we ready for it? Are we actually collaborating with the authorities to make sure um, it's done in a, in a manageable fashion? Um, so that kind of rolls on to the discussion we had earlier around PMAS and, and getting the engagement of, 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 the, of the membership and having a meaningful um, government lobby, you know, that, that, that includes us in the decision making rather than just dictates to us. Mm -hmm. Because you, we all know that when that happens, sometimes it's just not, man it's not workable. Because it's the actual, well, you see this with some deeds of condition, they're written in a certain way. And then it actually, the, the, the real life um, uh, scenario, we can't get the bins to that part of the pavement, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, so you do have to work together before the, the ink dries on the contract. Um, you look, I, I'm not heavily involved with PMES. Uh, we've always had somebody on on council and, and always will do because we feel uh, a responsibility as as part of the industry to um, to contribute and 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 and, and it interests us. We're, it's a key part of what we do. And and Red Path Bruce will always um, stick its hand up and uh, to help and and to be involved. But um, I think we need wider engagement, and I think we all need to support that organisation to uh, to keep it to relevant and um, and effective. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's very interesting to hear your views on that. Very, very interesting. So finally, um, <clears throat> there's a couple of, um, or three actually, kind of, kind of standard quirky questions that Jack's actually asked at the end of these um, podcasts. So um, she's been quiet for some time with you and I talking. So she's Jack, asleep. You, she's Jack, asleep. Wake her up. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to fire in with your um, three questions for the end? Sure, I have been listening intently. I absolutely haven't fallen asleep on the desk. And <laughs> um, thanks, Christian. So um, one of the, the first one of our three quirky questions is, what's your biggest failure across your entire career? And what did you learn from it? Oh, my goodness. I mean, where do I start? That's a much longer list than my uh, successes. So it's probably the best question to ask. Um, I could throw out some football manager um, uh, cliches like, well, you learn more from your failures than your successes. And um, uh, it's a cliche for a reason, because um, I probably have. And I've had plenty of fails, epic fails, as my sons would describe them. But the one that springs to mind, a bit like 141 West Regent Street, in terms of something I'd like to see um, uh, change, uh, the there was a and this is in a commercial capacity as a, as a trainee investment agent at rock spring co in edinburgh in the early 2000s um 1999 yeah 2000 something around about then back in the days of um you know mailing particulars to to clients to sell a property and we were selling an investment on 110 george street and um I'd done three other jobs, so I was slightly more mature trainee, and I think they gave me far too much responsibility and uh, uh, trusted me to know what I was doing when I didn't have a clue. Um, and anyway, it involved, you know, describing the property uh, and then comparable properties that were similar or different that had been sold at, at various prices, and, and that then justified the the, the price you were asking for this property. So I just dug out a schedule I'd seen in the office, fired it into the appendices and put together these particulars. My boss gave them the once over and and you would have two mailing lists, an early list to your your closest um, sort of allies among, in the industry and then a, a wider list to the, the greater market. And um, so I'd given, I had a girlfriend at Ryden's at the time and I'd given her a sneak preview um, uh, of the of the particulars the day we were posting out the the um the main mailing run to however many a couple of hundred people and so she phoned me up and i said and said um i've just read your particulars i was like yeah what do you think pretty snazzy they're they're, they're cool aren't they and she's like well they certainly look fine but have you been had a look at the appendices of that comparable schedule and i opened it up and i said yeah yeah that all looks great and then there was this column a comments column 
And of course, one of my bosses had used it to promote another building and in doing so had put in a whole list of criticisms of all these other buildings um, as to why they weren't as good as the one that he was trying to sell, uh, which I hadn't looked at or read or thought was untoward and then suddenly realized that, you know, listing other buildings in George Street severely criticized by the building <laughs> surveyor, low floor to ceilings height, not as good as this. I'm like, oh no. And of course, it's away in the post, first class to the whole oh. world. And um, I mean, it's the, it's the modern equivalent of that lad's meme that you're sending on WhatsApp that you sent <laughs> to your mother-in-law instead of the voice. And you're just trying to reel it back in, but you can't, it's gone. Um, um, uh, I mean, it's so much easier to make these mistakes now with, with social media, but, and I've done a few of those, but I won't share them. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, so this was a tragedy. So I immediately on the phone to my boss who was in London at the time. And I said, uh, bit of bad news. Uh, I put out a schedule that I think probably pretty damning of a lot of our clients, proper other clients, properties, uh, we probably need to, you know, move to DEFCON one. So uh, he he was like, all right, leave it with me. So he phoned the big boss, William Roxburgh. Uh, and as the story unfolded, and this was a Friday, so it just stew over the weekend. And um, I'd sort of get into bat on Monday morning. And uh, when William found out, apparently had to leave the office and walk around um, the city centre Edinburgh for an hour to calm down. Um, uh, Paddy, my then boss, who's in London, actually tendered his resignation on the back of having not um, proof the, um, the the particulars properly. It was rejected. They told him to, to, to tear up the letter. We'll solve it. And I mean, but it was it seemed catastrophic at the time, and it was such a dreadful error. And they, um, but what came of it? Sure, several of the people who had buildings in that um, schedule phoned up, uh, giving them you know what for for for. Uh, being offensive about their buildings, but they just took made a list of all the properties, all the clients that owned those properties, and arranged meetings, face to face meetings with them, and they just went on a crusade that week to go and see them all, and you know, fall on their swords, profusely apologize and say with this half wit graduate that, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I don't know if they did blame, it, but they they, were, they they should have, and but what came of that actually. And this is this is the the lesson from it. You know, we will make errors. Um, all of us were fallible. I know you're not Brian, but 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 I am. <laughs> and um, and it's not can we stop the errors? The errors will happen. It's how do you deal with them? You know, and mm -hmm. how, how do you make wrong the rights? Uh, make right the wrongs rather. And and I think the measure of a business and of people is how they behave when it goes wrong. And these two lads, uh, my bosses, then. Um, went and saw, sorted it. They faced the music, they fronted up. And I think they probably got more respect and better connections with those clients on the back of that. We sold the building for a record price as well, um, which is extraordinary. Um, uh, it did nothing. Actually, it created probably a bit of a buzz around the sale, would you believe? And, um, you know, no, no such thing as, uh, as bad press. Uh, but the lesson there, and, and I still recall it's kind of associated the wonderful old school bosses that I had in the early part of my career. Um, William used to go to, we, you dictate letters in the old days and they, they would go into the secretary's tray um, and they would get rewritten. You'd get the paper back, you'd scribble all over it again. It would go back three or four times. You'd use half a tree to write a letter. And, um, uh, and then eventually you'd sign it and it would go and it would be it would be finished and ready to go. Now, William got a hold of a signed letter that, that one of my colleagues, Stephen, had uh, written, ready to go. And uh, it reappeared back on Stephen's desk like a, an English essay from higher with so much red ink on it and um, lines through semicolons, um, you know, hyphens, all sorts of corrections. And at the bottom, he, and we still quote this to this day, he wrote, Stephen, killer focus for God's sake. And um, uh, I still joke, but I, I'm, I'm still in touch with a lot of the, the, the boys that worked there at the time. And the business doesn't exist anymore. The, but William's retired and moved on, but um, still alive, though. Great guy. And uh, we still joke about killer focus. And, 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 and that's what I lacked in that um, comparable schedule that went out wrong. And I think a lot of people lack it today because we're rushing. 
Mm. We're not yeah. reading the devil's in the detail. It's the, it's the full stops and the capital letters. Um, I know if I get something, you know, badly written, the content might be fine. I probably understand it, but I'm always a bit disappointed. And then, I, and then I probably judge the, the sender on the basis of the, the grammar or the spelling or the missing number, or whatever it is, you know, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean I'm not going to transact with them or do anything with them, but that killer focus, I think, is is lost, uh, is getting lost. Um, and I think we have to slow down and take time to actually reread what are we sending? What do the numbers say? Is it right? And then in doing that, you give a better um, uh, you give a better account of yourself, but you'll also make less mistakes, and mm -hmm. then you have less problems further down the line. And you'll know this CPL. I mean, we rely so much on what your software spits out to be right. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah. you only need one, you know, error in the chain, and the whole thing's wrong. And um, yeah. you live in the world of killer focus. And I just think more of us need to to slow down, stop, and just 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 give it another read. Um, it's so easy just to fire something off nowadays on email and um, or on, on social media, and then later on you regret it and realize they're spelled t-h-e-i-r instead of e-r-e -E. yeah um, it's the turn two as well isn't it too? So that was that was a fairly epic fail that, um, <laughs> that um, i thought i'd share with you it's nearly long enough in the past now that i've stopped twitching about it but um, <laughs> it was uh it was it was a bad day at the office that's for sure mm. It all, it all worked out in the end by the sounds of it, so so that's good. Um, so if you were on the world for a day, Christian, what would you do? That's your, your second quirky question. This is a horrendous question. <laughs> um, and um, I think given you guys are in the world of IT, I'd probably spend much of the day just getting my laptop sorted and my email <laughs> set up and uh, 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 making sure uh, IT had got me on the system and that I had an uh, address list. Uh, that would at least take a day. And then um, uh, I wouldn't have to worry about decisions the next day. I, somebody else would have to rule the world. But um, uh, I think I think does that, it, it's nearly the question, what would you do if you were a god for a day? Um, yeah. And I thought, well, Jim Carrey's already made a movie about that, Bruce Almighty. So just watch that. There's my answer. Um, mm -hmm. But um, actually, I thought I thought quite hard about this, and I don't have a brilliant answer. There's too much, yeah. and a day's not long enough. But I once went to a. a I, I, I do love going to see these guys like Paul Dunn. I went to see a guy called Graham Codrington. He's a South African. He's a futurologist and um, whatever that means. But uh, th these are guys in the, in, you know, they're motivational speakers and they're coaches and they, they, they try and make us better versions of ourselves. And I, and I you, know, you can listen to po performance podcasts with Jake Humphrey and people like that. And just if you absorb what these guys say for long enough, Hopefully some of it rubs off. You remember a few nuggets, you know, and if you can take a nugget from everything that you listen to um, or watch, uh, you take the good stuff, the stuff you like, then I think you will improve. Now, this guy, he was fascinating. You know, he talked about, um, you know, the power of our mobile phones. Got us all to put our hands up to say, uh, who's got a mobile phone here in the audience? I'm going back 10 years when I saw this guy. And um, uh Everyone, you know, 99% of the people in the room put their hands up. And he said, well, there's more technology in that mobile phone than there was in the Apollo 11 um, rocket that got man to the moon. You know, that's where we're at. If, I, if you'd said that to somebody in 1969, you go watch television on your watch, they'd say, you know, that's, that's nonsense. But we're, but we're already there. There's more technology actually in a washing machine, apparently, than there, is on, there was on Apollo 9. Apollo 11, rather, probably, certainly 9 as well, 9, 10, and 11. So he had this really quirky look at life and where we've come and where we're going. But one thing, he, he, he introduced me to the, 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 um, uh, the material graphene, which I'd never heard of. And that's not what I'm going to talk about because it a, it's a world-changing material. Uh, and it was discovered in Manchester, and they won a... Um, uh, a prize for the discovery of it. We've just not worked out how to efficiently make lots of it yet. And that's that's one thing, I, if I ruled the world for a day, I'd try and facilitate 
But it was something even bigger than that. Now, you may have heard of, of ITER before, I-T-E-R, but this is a huge global collaboration of, of governments. Uh, and it's not atom splitting, it, it's actually magnetic fusion. And the, 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 the theory is that you put a certain amount of megawatts into this machine, but it gives you more megawatts back out. So ultimately, you're in an energy positive situation. So you're creating limitless energy from this incredible machine. And I mean, it's in acres and acres of land. I think Southern France is the site for it. Um, you can go on the website and read all about it. Uh, it it's, it's, it's so big a game changer if it works. Um, you know, because if you, if you solve the energy problem on the planet, then you solve feeding people, you solve... Um, uh, all sorts of things, global warming. I mean, where'd you start? Um, you know, energy being the, the key thing that we have to harness and harness cleanly um, for for progression of the human race. So in a fantastical world where I ruled it for a day, I'd make ITER work. Um, but I don't think it can be done in a day, but I do my best. <laughs> so that's my answer to that. Crazy cool. I've, I've never heard of that before, so I'll, I'll check it out. I'm, 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 when it comes to energy, I'm kind of a, a nature-based woman, so um, I do like looking to nature for solutions. Uh, but I will check that out and see what it's see what it's all about. Thanks, Christian. Um, so the final question then: um, When you are seventy and you look back at your life, what will you be glad you did, or uh, is there anything that you'll feel proud of? something that you've done already or that you want to do uh i'd love it this is like the the no regrets um yeah. question and i'm like uh, anyone that says they've got no regrets is fibbing as far as i'm concerned <laughs> um, i have so many but um uh again I, I suspect that that's potentially what what makes us what we are um it's only 21 years away i i, I need to get a move on if i'm <laughs> Uh, leave something behind that I'm, I'm proud of. Um, it, we're really talking about legacy here, and um, that's the title of a book by a guy called James Kerr, which I could not recommend highly enough, which is based on the 15 mantras that the, the All Blacks adopted to become the most successful team in any sport in the history of mankind. If you didn't know that was the case, they are um, uh, they are that. And, and this chap James Carr has gone forensically into how they've done it and they've shared a lot with them which I always thought was they were a side clandestine team nobody knew how they made themselves as good as they are but it's right out there now you can read about it now I can't remember all 15 if I was really honest with you there's only really three that resonated with me um or I can remember uh that's probably says more about me than, than than the book. But one was sweep the sheds, which is, you know, you know, don't do a job that, that you aren't prepared to do yourself. Don't ask someone to do a job you're not prepared to do yourself. And the all black captain will sweep the sheds and clean the boots just like anyone else in the team. Um, I love, the next one is, is not terribly PC, but it's my absolute favorite. And that's uh, no dickheads. That's actually the title of the, the chapter. Um, and it's really about folk in your um, organization that, um, that, I mean, could be your top striker that scores the most goals, but if he doesn't toe the party line or, or, or conform to your culture, then you, you have to get rid of them because they will cause more disruption than, than, than the benefits that they create. Um, I've heard somebody describe it as no terrorists before. If you get terrorists in your organization, you've got to find a way to, to, to remove them because it's, it's bad for everyone. So that was um, that was the second one that I remembered. But the third one is legacy, and that's to to plant trees you won't see grow. And I just love that idea. Um, there's no benefit to me whatsoever. You've just got to create the, the sow the seeds, if you like, and 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 know that when when you're long gone, that that there will be trees of some description there, whatever they are. Um, so what are those for me? Um, well, I've got two wee boys um, of eight and four and put business to one side and everything else in life to one side. Once you're a parent, um, uh, you know, rightly or wrongly, these become the focus of, of all your energies. And uh, so I think in terms of a legacy, if I want to be pr proud of anything, I want to see them make successes of their lives um, for as long as I'm alive to, to watch them. 
so that that's actually my first goal is just the uh, uh, the the future and securing a decent future for my two boys. Um, in terms of the business, I think given that that's the second largest focus of my life, being aside um, rock music and um, and golf, uh, uh, I'd. Uh, you know, you want to leave the business in better shape than you found it. And we found it in pretty good shape, to be honest, Ryan and I. And and uh, that doesn't just mean we want to greater turnover or profit. Um, you know, that's all good stuff. And the business to be successful has to has to grow and it has to be profitable. But um, it's, it's more than that. We need to have happy, motivated staff uh, created and cultivated a culture there where people work hard for themselves but for each other and 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 feel they can thrive there and realize their goals there's no glass ceilings there's no limitations to what they can do when they work with us um robert campbell's just retired um from red path bruce after 48 years uh with us he's worked mm -hmm. nowhere else and he came in making the tea and, and you know, uh, probably licking stamps and what have you. He told some amazing stories when he retired. And we did a couple of parties and on different floors of the office to be COVID safe when he was retiring. Um, and he rose to director. He's been one of our key players for a number of years. And, um, uh, you know, I'm whilst I had very little to do with his career path, I'm, I'm really glad to have worked with him. And I'm, I'm very proud that the business um you know gave robert that platform to flourish um and uh so i i'd like to see more of that if we can if we can sustain a business that that creates that loyalty and that sacrifice from our people they feel that they want to remain part of of of, of something that we think special and i want to see the core values of the business let's go back to the, the better lives program you know helping others that needs to be front and center of what we do and of course that's for our customers first and foremost but also the benefactors of our philanthropy so um if all of that is in place when i pop my socks um and it's healthy and thriving then then you know i'd look back and i'd say well um, I didn't. I didn't destroy that. You've got to remember, we're third generation round and I. So, the, the, as the saying goes, it's clogs to clogs and three generations. We're 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 effectively destined to sink the boat. So, I suspect if we just managed not to sink the boat, then maybe that's an achievement. Um, and mm -hmm. I suppose uh, the last part of that, if my parents are proud of my small contribution to their legacy, um, uh, and my grandparents' legacy, then you know, I don't. I'm not asking for any more than that. That's um, I'd be happy with that in this in my little um, uh, corner of the world. Lovely, that was really nice way to to end the podcast. I think Brian, do you want to? Yeah, that was that's fabulous. That was really that was really insightful. That's been that's been great chatting to you, um, actually because we haven't as I've ever spent this amount of time kind of listening to your views and thoughts of the world and property management. And we never even spoke about golf. So that's something we'll need to talk about <laughs> at some point, although I am not very good at it. Um, I so, think you should start a golf pod podcast, uh, Brian, just yeah. for property, real estate people. I think I'll have huge take up. Yes, yes. But I do notice that I've never seen you at the PMAS Golf Day. I I've played in it. I've played in it a few times, but I've now been pushed out the side door because, um, uh, uh, and quite rightly, Adele and well, and Robert, who who yeah. who's played in it, who, who, you see, who wins it with regularity. Yeah. I think. Well, my yeah. father's my father's won it. Adele won it last the last time it happened. Yeah. Um, uh, there'll be a handicap review there, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, uh, so as a result, they you know they fill the slots and and take the odd client or um, contractor. And uh, they feel that's of more benefit to the business than me getting to play. So I just do as I'm told. I go yes, play somewhere well. else. But yeah, well, um, good, good. Uh, well, we we must have a man, a game sometime, yes. Brian. Uh, we can talk offline about that. But it'd be we good can. to have a, a round of golf and talk some more nonsense. No, 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 but that's great. Thank you very much. That that was really interesting. And and yeah, I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. I'm sorry, I've prattled on so long and and hopefully it's editable jacks um i really enjoy doing it and uh, I, I it is one of my favorite pastimes is is chewing the fat over what we do and why we do it um and i think it does help us all um sort of clarify and and reset um 
you know, as a reminder as, as to why we got up in the morning and go to work. Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, the culture you're trying to build is just phenomenal, you know. And you do work in a difficult industry and there's a huge amount of movement around at the moment. So, so no, that, yeah, was, that was great. That was great. Uh, Look, we're just going to keep battling on. I think there's huge challenges at the moment. Everybody's stressed and and overworked and and um, grappling with angry customers and and water. You, you I, I was going to make a joke earlier about the fact that you know everyone's affected. So the huge rains that we got in August, that um, not August, the month before that, there was a river going down Stockbridge. And we've got clients going, why haven't you not attended? You know, we've got we've got 10 properties in the city at the moment that are knee deep in water. You know, is there a priority list as to who gets first um, dibs? But our own office, you know, sprung a leak in, in Edinburgh and the one in Glasgow sprung a leak. Like we're, we're filling up with water as well. You know, we're not immune from <laughs> from the the uh, um, the weather events that have been uh, you know, causing us so much grief. So it does affect everyone. Property management, property, the, the the roof over our heads. Everybody has something to say about it, um, and yeah. has their views on it. Uh, and in some respects, that makes it a fairly, because it's a ubiquitous requirement and need. Then it then then, it, then there's longevity in the trade and the industry, which is good for you because you provide the software, and it's good for us because we're trying to fix the leaks. Yeah. What one of the things I think that has to change i'd love to change is just people think it's all right to phone up and abuse their factor when they wouldn't yeah. do the same to yeah. a lawyer or a shopkeeper or the woman at the check-in at, at jet two and I, I i don't understand where that's come from and i think it's an indictment on our society and the scots and mainly scottish people to be honest they, i'm sure the english can be equally as offensive in a different environment there uh, we block manage in england and it is a more civilized affair. They pay better fees, and there's an expectation that we'll do a job there. But in Scotland, it's it's out of kilter, and uh -huh. um, uh, and you know what? It's I don't know. If, it's a bit like trying to say we want to get rid of sectarianism in between Rangers and Celtic. You know, it's that's mm. a long road, <laughs> yeah. um, and and it's the same with the treatment of factors. But on the on the basis that we just accept that, and we have a way of dealing with it. We just get on with life and, and do the best we can and, and um, hope that there's enough fun in the office. There's another reason for going back to the office. You can have fun in the office yeah. talking about that madman Brian Welsh and the, the rubbish he said. When you're sitting at home just being abused by him, you don't get to turn around to somebody and say, um, you know, I, I'm only using you for, for a laugh, Brian. Yeah. I don't mean you, but we've got lots of people. You know, you need to be able to share the, the, the rubbish stuff too. And that's another benefit of being in the office. Um, yeah. So. Excellent. Nice nice well, thank you again for having me and um, have a lovely rest of the week. We'll yeah, catch you up too. soon. And Brian, we will get that game of golf. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Nice okay, one. cool. Okay. Cheers. Okay. See you later. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. And that was part two of the Block Talk podcast with Christian Bruce. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening.